Julia Pete from uh, Northwestern University. Okay, uh, she got her PhD in 2006 from Stanford in astronautics and then aerospace engineering in, in 1999. And her bachelor's degree was from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology in Russia. And she did her bachelor's in mathematics and physics. Currently, she is a, a NSF research and teaching fellow at the Department of Engineering Sciences and Mathematics at Northwestern University. And she also has a joint appointment with the Argonne Nation Lab. And she is working as assistant computational scientist in mathematics and computer science division at Argonne Nation Lab. And she is going to tell us what she has been doing. And especially, she is going to talk about integrative approach to modeling and simulation of complex systems. The way that it goes is she is going to speak for about an hour. And then the students will have time to interact with her. Okay, with that brief introduction, Dr. Yulia Pee. Please. Thank you, Dr. Ramadan, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, I would like it to be an informal seminar, so please feel free to ask questions, interrupt me, and if you don't understand anything, um, just ask. So I will talk about uh, integrated uh, simulations and uh, of complex systems, but my background is from computation fluid dynamics, so that will be mostly fluid systems. Well, at least some part of those complex systems will be fluid systems. Um, so as an overview, I will first explain what I mean by integrative simulation. It is not a standard word. I think many people use this word and it means different things for everyone. So I will try to explain what I mean by that and what I'm trying to do in my research. I will show some examples of what simulations one could do which I would consider to be integrative simulations. In my field, I will also talk about some uh, prerequisites and tools which you need in order to perform integrative simulations. So you need to develop some methods, some codes, and I will talk about that. And then I will uh, just show some examples uh, of uh, simulations I have done myself. And first, I guess chronologically, I will start with my uh, first work in the city, my PhD work. That's how it all started. Uh, and I will talk about compressible low Mach number flow coupling. And you can uh, simulate some multi-component flow system with that. Then I will uh, take a little break from examples and talk about some algorithmic requirements. What do you want your code to have in order to be good for integrative simulations? And then I will uh, proceed with some examples. with some fluid thermal interaction in energy systems. that's supposed to be fluid structure interactions, which is not showing for some reason. And uh, at the end, if I have some time, I will also talk about integrative simulations in biology. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been interested in that or not, but I was recently really passionate about biology as well. This is not the main thing I do. I mostly do energy systems, but I was trying to uh, also look at some biological systems. So what I mean by integrative modern simulations? Uh, as you all know, realistic systems engineering, physical or biological, they're all complex. And they probably have more than one phenomena you want to account for. And uh, those phenomena interact with each other. These are interacting processes. So usually when we model these systems, we can't model everything. Usually people just model one phenomena and don't account for the other just because it's hard to, to, uh, to do computationally. Uh, you would need some special tools to account for more than one phenomena. What I'm trying to do in my research is actually to couple different phenomena in one uh, computational simulation in order to uh, reduce the amount of sim simplifications we make and make our computational tools more uh, reliable. Of course, significance is uh, uh, very well understood because since this interaction is usually missing, and since we know that computational models don't always work very well, sometimes we get disagreement with experiments, or if we model biological systems, you can't predict what happens in, uh, in vivo. You get some in vivo measurements and your computational model predicts different things. Well, maybe because that, that interaction was missing. So if you try to account for interaction between process, we're going to get better and better computational uh, model and better and better agreement with the real life. And that will, of course, help us understand the phenomena better and explain some key mechanisms which we didn't have before, which we didn't know. And, uh, it's also going to sort of try to uh, bring different fields together. Because traditionally we have fluid, computational fluids, people work 
in their own area in computational material people, for example, work in their own area. So those integration simulations will try to bring those fields together and before uh, joint fluid material computations and promote exchange of information between fields. So we try to integrate uh, the science together. So let me show some examples of simulations I can do or I want to do. So uh, it all started with my work at Stanford. I was uh, working there at the Center for Integrated Turbulence Simulations. So in Stanford, they were interested in uh, simulating very uh, large turbulent flows. So one of the projects I was involved in is uh, simulating the flows through an entire gas turbine engine. And that was a big 10-year uh, program in Stanford, funded by DOE through Accelerated Strat Strategic Computing Initiative. And uh, that also funded my PhD research. So I was involved with that, and I will tell you details a little bit later. This is just an example here. And uh, another uh, multi-component system, you can think about, for example, the turbine cooling. You have uh, cooling jets, which uh, come out of the cooling, surface, cooling holes and interact with the hot flow. So this is also a multi-component system. There are different components. There is the, the film holes, which bring the cooling jet, and there is the flow across the surface. And those, uh, I would call those systems uh, multi-component systems. So they are featured by geometrical complexity. In addition, in different components, we can have different uh, Flow physics, even if you don't talk about uh, different processes in terms of fluid and structure, for example, it's all fluid here. Even uh, then, we can have different models for your fluid flow in different components. And you will still have to do some multi-physics coupling, some code coupling. That's how integrative simulation will come in. Uh, well, I have four examples of, uh, of uh, integrative simulations, and I will start talking more about what I've done. Uh, so the second example is uh, if you were trying to model multi-scale interaction. And this is very relevant for uh, atmospheric flows, uh, oceanic, oceanic flows, environmental flows. You have a very large system and uh, often uh, small scale dynamics uh, influences the large scale dynamics. So for example, something uh, of a small scale happens here, like some landscape non-uniformity or mixing of a stream with different density. And you have some small scale processes which you need to resolve well. You need to write some kind of uh, more detailed equations for this process. But then this dynamics is propagating everywhere uh, on a large scale, maybe scale of kilometers. And you don't want to resolve all the small scales when you don't need to because it will be very computationally expensive. So for this large scale, you want to solve some easy, simple equations, some primitive equations. And you want to couple those two processes together so you would have one computational code which solves your multi-scale dynamics in one region and another one solves the primitive equations on a large scale. And you would need to couple those models together. That's another example of integrative simulations. Uh, third one is a fluid thermal interaction and this is very relevant in energy systems. And as you know, uh, in energy systems, we try to drive the temperature as high as we can, just because uh, efficiency is usually higher when you operate at high temperatures. But you cannot drive it uh, infinitely high because then your materials will blade, so will melt. So uh, there is a very uh, much need for research on how fluids interact with materials and how we can. Uh, find this compromise when uh, what temperature is, high, is as high as we can make it to be. And uh, again, traditionally, what is done in those areas as uh, fluid mechanics code is run alone, and you don't know what happens with the surface, with the surface temperature. So what I am interested in is to perform joint simulation of temperature propagation in a fluid and in a solid state and couple it together, and that I call integrative fluid thermal simulations. And my last example is fluid structure interaction, and I guess I don't need to uh, explain you why is this an integrative simulation, because uh, in many processes it is important to account for uh, the influence of your flow on your structure. So, for example, on the wind turbines, when wind moves around, your structure starts vibrating, and that uh, changes the velocity field around it. 
So if you want to try to model uh, what happens in the fluid and in the solid, that's called fluid structure interaction. And that is also of interest in many energy systems such as wind turbines, reactor fuel rods, heat exchanger tubes, offshore structures, and also in biological systems like blood flow, pulmonary flow, that's important. So those are type of integrated simulations I'm talking about. They all involve fluids, but they all involve more than one physical process I want to look for. And uh, now let me start talking about what do we need in addition to determination to perform integrated modeling approach. So you can't just uh, go ahead and with one code say I'm going to do integrative simulations. First you need to develop a mathematical model. You need to understand what equations for each process you take and uh, what is going to be a reasonable way to couple them so that your whole system is stable and that you know which variables are going to talk to each other, which variables are going to be transformed across the interface. So that's the first thing, model development. And usually it involves multi-physics models because phenomena are different. Second development is numerical development. Usually, you already know how to solve fluid equations efficiently. There is tons of research in that, and you know how to solve structure equations efficiently. What is not known or what is hard is how to make those codes, those numerical methods, uh, to talk to each other in a strongly coupled manner. I mean, every time step, uh, not just you do one simulation and you do another simulation, but how can they interact with each other in a stable manner? Stability question is very important. It always comes in. You start, even if you integrate, couple the same code, if you first thing, first thing you will see that your code blows up. I guarantee you whatever you do first thing, it will blow up and you don't know why. So this is very important to understand why and how to integrate them numerically in a stable manner. And of course the third part is actually the algorithmic development. If you have those two different codes, or even if, it is, uh, if there are two of the same codes, you still need to make sure that your domain is decomposed in the right way. You can manage them parallel. Uh, they are scalable at the end, so this is uh, the, the code integration. And again, when I'm talking about integrative simulations here, mostly what I'm doing is code integration. Uh, they all involve more than one code, and how to couple these codes together, that's the whole science, and I've been sort of trained to do that since my PhD. Um, so now let me talk more in depth about my research, about what I've done, about how we integrate these codes in those particular different applications. And I will start with that uh, probably uh, the easiest kind of, uh, well not the easiest, but the simplest way of integrative simulation. I might not even see why it's integrative simulations. Uh, because all these components involve fluid flow, nonetheless I had to couple different codes for it. And that's what I will tell you about. So okay, let's uh, Look at this jet engine. So we want to simulate the flow in the whole jet engine, starting from compressor across the combustor and going into the turbine. Well, those, of course, it has like difficult geometry. So even geometrically, you might have to take different codes and couple them together. In terms of physics, what happens? In a compressor and a turbine, uh, the flow is very high speed flow. So compressible effects are important. And we would need to uh, account for this compressibility. So we would need compressible equations. Uh, in the combustor, on the other hand, do you hear me well or should I talk more into the microphone? It's fine. It's fine? Okay. Uh, so in the combustor, the, the flow has a very low speed and compressible effects are not important and you can't really model it with compressible code. You have to use uh, code which is designed for low velocity, such as low Mach number code. And so you have to couple here compressible and low Mach number code. <coughs> In my PhD thesis for uh, turbine co cooling, and I will tell you in details about it because it's my PhD thesis, I cannot skip it. So what I'm interested in is to see how you can cool, cool the turbine blades. Uh, and they become very hot because the gas coming from combustor is very hot. And you guys here develop high temperature materials. It's because it's important for the material not to melt. But what we do on the fluid side, we try to cool this material. We try to help, help it not to melt. So what we do is we put the, uh, we take some gas, well this is a model, this is not the exact geometry, but this is the model I'm working with. So we take some uh, gas from the uh, compressor, it's going to be relatively cold because it wasn't in the combustor chamber. And we uh, 
injected through the tiny filled holes onto the surface of a bl blade. And we want this cool gas to stay around the surface and not to give, not to let material to become in contact with the hot gas. So we call it film cooling. And uh, again, I will tell you some details about this uh, work a little bit later. Now, let us focus on the code integration aspect. So why do I need, why do I say it is a multi-physics system? Because if you look at the, again, the flow properties in all these different places, we see that uh, above the blade surface, flow comes from compressor, it's very high speed, and it's compressible. So we need to model compressible effects. Inside the plane, flow is mostly standing. It's not moving anywhere. So flow is uh, basically very uh, low speed, again, low Mach number. So to perform those simulations, we couple, well, three codes, really. Low Mach number for plenum, same low Mach number for film hole, and a compressible for above the surface. And now let me talk about a little bit about model development, numerical, de numerical development, uh, and what Chile just brings up. So if you want to couple two codes, first uh, question you need to address is how you're going to manage the different domains, because every code has its own computational grid. The question you want to ask, do you get them overlap or not overlap? If you don't overlap them, suppose you have your different grids, and you try to make sure that your nodes exactly coincide. And this has some advantages. First of all, if you, this code wants to know velocity from this code, you don't have to interpolate anything. It's already in there. So no interpolation is required. What is disadvantage? Well, because it's hard to mesh. If you have difficult geometry, for example, turbine engine, and your one component is a turbine, another component is a combustor, you need to create your mesh so that these nodes are exactly coincide. So this code, when you mesh it, needs to know the other code mesh. And actually, meshing, I think it's 80% of difficulty in numerical simulations, in realistic geometry numerical simulations, because getting the mesh is what is most difficult. You have your code, it will work. You give it the mesh, it will work. But how do you get this mesh? This is tough. So this uh, approach would be hard to use for complex geometries. Well, there is, there is another approach, overlapping method. We have two domains which do overlap. And what was advantage here will become disadvantage here. If they overlap, it means that if I want to know the velocity, say, in this node, it is not, does not exactly coincide with the velocity with the node, computation nodes of the other code, so you have to interpolate, you have to get this velocity by interpolation. Well, that's disadvantage. Of course, advantage is that you don't need to think about mesh and you mesh your components the normal way you do it in your standalone simulations and you just sort of plug and play. And since it's so easy in, in practical applications, uh, we are mostly using overlap methods. So for this project, for the low Mach number compressible coupling, we use overlap methods. In other projects I've been involved, we also use overlap methods. Sometimes it's not easy to do, sometimes, for example, for fluid structure interaction, it's better not to use overlap methods, but uh, mostly I will talk to you about overlap methods. Okay, so we chose our domain decomposition scheme. Now we need to actually couple compressible and low Mach number equations. And I don't know if you guys are very familiar with fluid dynamics, but uh, well, those are all complicated equations. They're all three-dimensional. Uh, all of them have five equations, continuity, three momentum, and one energy. Uh, what makes them so different is that is the role of pressure. Basically, in compressible system, pressure is its own variable. You change the density, your pressure can change. Well, in incompressible or low Mach number system, pressure is not independent variable. In fact, your density only comes from the change of temperature. Your change of density, your pressure doesn't change. Uh, so those two variables are sort of coupled in a low Mach number system. So these different roles of pressure also changes the complete nature of equation. For example, here uh, pressure is a variable, and here pressure is just a Lagrange multiplier. It only need, it only is needed here to make to satisfy the continuity equation. And uh, from applied mathematical or from mathematical points of view, it means that compressible system is hyperbolic and low Mach number system is elliptic. It means for low Mach number system, you tap it right here, you will instantaneously feel a change over here because your acoustic waves propagate with an infinite speed, your Mach number is zero. 
in compressible system, if you tap your system, your if you tap it over here, it will only feel it over here when acoustic wave comes in here, not instantaneously, but after some time. So it means that those are different systems. We have different record system because number of variables of independent variables is actually different, five here and four here. So does it mean it's hard to couple them? Well, mathematically, yes. Mathematically, you cannot prove anything. You try to write your coupling, you can't make, you can't, you can't prove if it's going to be stable or not. Numerically, is it try to couple? Well, no, because you can always play with things, right? You can, you can't prove anything, but you can just try to derive your past boundary conditions by uh, trying many different things and see which works. So that's the approach we had to follow. We couldn't prove anything, but we could try to. Uh, Try to do many different things, and we found that in one specific case, when basically we just supply all variables from compressible code into the other code without any changes, and we supply those variables back, and we do some tricks for temperature and pressure, which I'm not going to describe in details. That ends up to be stable and robust in, in all of the cases we tried. And of course, <coughs> Another important part of numerical development is verification. So we, we have to make sure our method works um, by comparing our solution with analytical solution. So there is two type of uh, two type of checking we have to do in our numerical simulation work. You have to do verification and validation. And uh, you probably heard that verification validation phrase because all, all national labs they are very uh, very taking it very seriously. So verification is to see if you're solving your equations right. Basically, it's to see if uh, you will get exact solution of your, of your system. So to, very, to check versus analytical solution. And validation is to see if you're solving the right equation. So you have your phenomena. Basically, validation means comparison with experiments. And here we don't have any experiments. It's just simple vortex propagation, but we did have an analytical solution, simple fluid dynamical problems, and we looked at uh, error, and we see that error is not not very big, so the code is stable, accurate, and uh, works. So let me now switch to our realistic simulations we did with this method to turbulent cooling, and I guess I already introduced what it is about. So it's uh, when you take this is real geometry now, not simplistic. So my, it might be easier for you to see. So you take some uh, cooling gas, which is shown in red here. You take it from compressor. You supply it through so those pin holes, all those holes here. There are many of them, not just one. There are holes which are drilled in the surface of a turbine blade. You supply it through uh, across the surface, and you see how fluid mechanics develops. So basically, what you see is to make sure that your uh, plate is indeed cool, so your surface temperature goes down when you uh, inject those cooling jets. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to simulate this phenomenon and compare this with experiments for validation. Uh, we wanted to look at the physics to see uh, how cooling works and uh, why it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, then suggest what we can do to improve it. So these are the goals of the study. Um, so this is the setup of our problem. We didn't look at the exact geometry because we really wanted to compare with experiments, and experiments are usually done with simplified geometries. And of course, when we start doing something, we want to start with simpler things rather than more complicated things. So we, we simulated the experimental setup of Docker group from UT Austin, and um, we tried to use the same parameters as they, as they did. And our computational setup we had three domains, one for the plenum, very large plenum, one for the fill hole from where cooling gas is coming out, and one box which represents the flow around the turbine surface. So we have a turbine boundary layer coming here, it's hot, and we have our uh, gas, which is, well, here it's just laminar flow comes in, but then it quickly turbolizes here in a fill hole, and it comes in, and there is lots of turbulence interaction, and we modeled, it, we modeled it with large eddy simulation. So first, I want to show you results of validation. So in large eddy simulations and in experiments, when the flow is turbulent, you collect your uh, statistics. So you collect your uh, instantaneous 
uh, variables, it, it will, it's some space points, right? So you put your measurement points in some place and you collect your uh, time dependent signal and it's changing, right? Because it's a turbulent flow, things are changing. So then you average over the time, so you get time average data. And that's what we are comparing. We are comparing our time average data with their time average data. And that's because you can't compare this instantaneous, right? It changes all the time and uh, there's no way you can agree with your experiments because it's a turbulent flow. But the statistics should be the same. Time average data should be the same. And so we looked at velocity, time average velocity, or we call it mean velocity, at some uh, specific locations in the flow. And we compare this mean velocity between experiments and simulations. And we see that the agreement in mean velocity is very, very good. And here we compare turbulent statistics. So basically it's a measure of how much the flow fluctuates, how much in, gen in, in average, how much your quantities are different uh, from your mean quantities. So how much is that uncertainty you get. And you can look at turbulent kinetic energy. This is just a, you get your fluctuation uh, for in each velocity component, you square it and you sum it all up. Um, and you can also look at shear stresses, as all fluid mechanical terms. Statistics is usually much harder to predict than mean velocity. Nonetheless, we got still very good agreement with experiment. So here we're trying to look at flow physics uh, and try to see what happens with that cooling jet. Does it actually stay attached to the turbine as you want it to be? So what do you want is you want this cooling jet to come out, rotate a little bit, and sort of uh, just create this buffer layer between the surface and the gas. But of course, that's not what happens. It's a very difficult fluid mechanical system, and there are lots of vortex structures uh, which start occurring. Well, the, okay, what happens here? So think it's a cold jet, and this is a hot cross flow. Well, first of all, your hot cross flow comes around the jet. The jet, of course, doesn't bend instantaneously. It doesn't actually come close to the surface. It depends on an angle. If you inject it 90 degrees, it will definitely not come close to the surface. If you inject, say, 30 degrees, it will be better. That's, what done, that's what's done in cooling jets. They are inclined. It will be better, but still it will not be ideal because this hot gas will always come around. And what happens is that place here never gets enough thin cooling coverage because the jet comes high and the hot gas comes around and hits the surface here. Another uh, vortex structure which is very dominant is the counter rotating vortex pair. So it starts, so you see those are cross sections along the jet. So this is what happens pretty much at the jet. There are some vorticity pockets which form. If you go further and further away, they become bigger and bigger, and gradually the whole uh, motion is occupied by those very strong counter rotating vortices. So what it means, it means that our coolant really diffuses with the hot cross flow. So you lose cooling efficiency if you go away from the jet because of this uh, diffusion process which is really strengthened by this uh, counter rotating vortex pair. So it looks like all those vortex structures, they play against us. They play to make our cooling efficiency uh, lower. So if you look at uh, mean temperature from our simulations, here the blue means a cold jet and red means hot cross flow, so you see this phenomenon of jet liftoff. That uh, instead of bending, of course, jet comes up and then it comes down. So this surface here doesn't get much coverage. Uh, so the same conclusion can be also made from uh, looking at other cross sections. So it's not that easy to cool your to cool to cool your turbine. This is the instantaneous flow field. You see, there is lots of turbulent interaction. Um, here we have unfortunately color switch and I never went around, went back to fix it. It was six years ago when I did that study. So here red means cold uh, cross flow and blue means hot flow. So those blue uh, region here is actually high temperature. That's what we don't try to avoid. Okay, so what's the lesson from it? The lesson is not easy to <laughs> cool our blade. And we want to try to make this transition as smooth as possible. So what is done in industry, what is proposed, is instead of doing this sharp corner to smooth this entrance, and it's called uh, the, uh, the diffused entrance or diffused uh, thin cooling holes, 
when uh, they sort of gradually turn in. That helps. It doesn't make it it's uh, perfect, but that helps. And of course, we are still researching, right? It's still a field of active research, what exactly to do here. And there are lots of things you can do. Um, but that concludes my study, not my talk, my PhD study. Um, and uh, let me take a little break uh, and start talking about some algorithmic aspects. So yes, we want to, to, to make, to do this integrative simulations. And as you saw, we want to try to account for more than one phenomenon, more than one component. So those simulations are computationally very expensive. The question is, do we, do we have enough computer resources to do those simulations? So what computers can we use? And uh, there, is a, uh, there is a drive in US, and Argon is uh, involved in it very uh, intensely to move our computing capability on a high level. So uh, exascale computing paradigm, paradigm, paradigm is uh, being launched. And for now, we have a very very good computers, very powerful computers on a petascale level, which do 10 to the 15th power floating operations per second. We want to move them to the 10 of 18th power operation per second. And the uh, uh, progress is to be done by 2018. And we do have a large chunk of money devoted to that. And we want to try to beat uh, a Chinese uh, supercomputer, which is now fastest in the world. And just this pie here shows you that US is actually very involved, and US owns a lot of uh, powerful computers, and we actually have more than 50% of all the world supercomputers. So uh, we do have resources, and we will have resources. And integrative simulations are the ones we should target them, because if they're building this computer power, then for what? Exactly for that type of simulations. Okay, now we have to ask another question. If uh, integrated simulation should target the scale resources, do we have an adequate software to use it? Because it's also not that easy. You have this powerful, powerful, powerful supercomputer, but do you have a code which, which can use it? If you just have a serial code, obviously you cannot take advantage of it. Even if you have parallel code, but which is not very good, it also cannot take advantage of it. You need to make sure that if you add your processes, your, your computer time actually goes down and goes down linearly. And if you have a lot of processes, there are a lot of issues. Uh, you, can, you need to make sure you, uh, uh, you don't have a memory failure, you don't have a code failure. So it's hard to use many processes, even if you have a good parallel code. So you have to have specially built <coughs> software for it. And uh, si since I joined Argon, it was past my <coughs> job, which I, Kulian work, which I just told you about. When I joined Argon three years ago, uh, I came across those, the open source uh, in-house fluid thermal code, name 5000, and it is actually very good in terms of scalability. So it is ideal candidate for integrative simulations, and this is the code I'm working with now. I'm trying to push that code towards uh, integrative simulations. So why is it so good? Well, it has many nice features. First of all, first of all it's a spectral element code, and <coughs> Um, there are not many numerical people here, but I will tell you what it is about a little bit later. Well, spectral element actually means high order method. It is very accurate. It's not second order, actually, not third, actually exponentially accurate, like spectral methods. Uh, it's also very efficient, stable. It has uh, good properties, good, good computation properties. I don't want to grab too much. I haven't developed it, but I am co developing it now. I'm making it better. It was recognized as the Golden Ball Prize for parallel performance in 1999. And uh, to show you that it really does work, it really does scale for many processors. This is the uh, billion bit point simulations done at Argon in application to a nuclear reactor cooling, which I also will tell you in a second about it. But what I want to show you here, simulations were done on BlueGMP, their Argon supercomputer with 100,000 processors. You see the scalability is very good, so it's almost ideal. It means you add 100,000 processes and your computer time goes 100,000 times down. Uh, so this is the code I'm currently working on. Let me, as I promised, just tell you the basic idea behind spectral element method, and I will be very simple here. You, of course, all very well know what this finite element method is. We, well, if you don't know details, that's fine. We, uh, 
take a domain and you subdivide it into chunks, call, calling elements. That's how finite element works. Okay, the rest is details. But with this finite element method, within each domain, within each, within each element, within, within each chunk, you sort of approximate your uh, function linearly. So this is second order accurate. What we do here, instead of making uh, those functions linear, we make them polynomial of any degree. How you do it? Well, you put points inside this element. So each element is itself subdivided into n points, or n squared, n 2d, n cube, n 3d. And we cluster them in a special way. This is gauss lobato clustering. Uh, well, it's also details, but what you get out of it is that uh, using each element you get n's order accuracy, so you have n's order polynomial. And uh, now we have a finite element method which is spectral convergence, because within each element we have a spectral method, and we, we have a geometrical, geometrical flexibility of finite element mesh. Uh, so what I have developed in this code since I joined is that code is good for, for integrative simulations, except that it only had one domain. And you saw with, uh, with integrative simulations, we need at least two domains because we want to uh, look for at least two phenomena or at least two components. So what I did is I put multi-domain uh, capability in here with our overlapping grid strategy. So now within this code, we also have two domains which, which can overlap. What is, what is better with this code than the codes I used before? Well, first of all, it is the same code. I can prove things analytically now. I don't have this uh, different equations coupling uh, issue. Another thing is that uh, we can use spectral interpolation routines, and we actually retain our spectral accuracy in the whole domain, not only in individual subdomains. So uh, it's not by linear interpolations before, it's actually retaining your spectral accuracy. Uh, as I said, we can investigate things analytically, which, uh, which we did. So this uh, was implemented in parallel with NPI platform, uh, validated against some experiments, some other numerical simulations. Uh, so I guess I still have 15 minutes, right? Okay, so even if I don't finish, I uh, so, okay, I told you in the very beginning that you remember that important issue when you integrate codes is stability, right? So you start coupling codes, they blow up. So we found that with our, uh, our multi-domain approach as well. So normal thing to do, okay, you have uh, your, your domains and they are uh, advancing in time. So in this domain, you want to know uh, information from the other domain. Your new information is not available to you unless you implicitly couple it as a hassle. So if you explicitly couple it, you usually just take your information from the previous time step and advance your new solution with that time step and, uh, and so on. Um, it's called pretty much Schwarz Schwarz overlapping method in, multi, in, in domain decomposition community. And what we know about this method, it's actually remarkably stable. It always works. So here is just some cartoon shows that uh, this is a simple one-dimensional heat equation solution. So this is stable. The problem with this method is first order accurate in time. You just take your information from the previous time step. Well, can you do better than that? Uh, yes, you can. You can try to do some uh, higher order extrapolation in time, right? You can take two previous solutions from two previous time steps manipulate them in the a, in a usual interpolation way and get solution for the new type step. And we thought it's an excellent idea. It will give us second order temporal accuracy. Or if you want third order temporal accuracy, you can do third order interpolation, so on. What we found out is that solution is unstable. And you do have to work here a little bit, but you'll see that. So we found out that an unrealistic solution, it blew up for us. And then we tried this model problem, and we saw that it also blew up. So we were very interested in explaining this. And again, we are coupling the same code now, and it's incompressible equations, and here we can actually just look for a simple heat equation to model that phenomena. Now we can do things analytically. And um, I'm not gonna bore you with, with details, but just show you that we have two domains which overlap. You can simplify it so that overlap exactly 
so all the nodes exactly overlap. You can play with this overlap size. You can sort of write down your equations. Then you put it in a matrix form, and your uh, code is stable if, uh, because it's going to be eventually iteration code. It's time stepping, so you will have an iter iterative code. And your iterations are stable when the spectral radius of your matrix, meaning the largest logging value, is less than 1. And it's unstable if it's more than 1. So you can write it down in a matrix form, uh, look at the uh, spectral radius, and indeed you see that for first order extrapolation it's always stable. Uh, those different lines correspond to just different like parameters overlap versus uh, domain size. And so when you do it with a second order temporal extrapolation, you see that first it's less than one, and then it becomes more than one. So obviously, if you're somewhere around here, it's unstable. Well, you can approve it, right? You can just go with well, this S is a non-dimensional parameter, which is basically a non-dimensional time step. So you can always go with smaller time step, and then it will be stable. And our uh, work uh, helped to give the guide the guidelines on what time step you can choose in order to still be stable. We can do it for high order extrapolation as well. And uh, we also looked at iterations. Because when I saw before, OK, we, we sort of take our solution from previous time, and we move ahead. Well, you can do some inner iterations, right? Before moving to the next computational time step, you can sort of iterate back and forth several times. And iterations actually do help with stability. So for first order, you don't need to do that. Uh, it's already stable. For second order, if you do some iterations, it helps a lot, and uh, even if you are as high as, say, S equal to 200, you usually don't need more than a couple of iterations. Three or four is usually what you need, and I also have those graphs of telling you how many iterations you need. Like that. So let me talk about current and future applications of, uh, of that code, of that multi-domain code. And as I told before, the oceanic flowing flow model is of interest. So now we have two domains. We can uh, look at that problem. And uh, Paul Fisher, which is a uh, uh, supervisor of my Argon collaborator, they wrote a proposal which was funded. So they're going to look at uh, this, uh, this flow with the code I developed. Another area is to look at uh, turbo machinery flows to uh, energy systems, gas turbines, because you can do moving meshes now. You can actually look at inter interaction between rotor and a stutter. And this area of reactor solvent hydraulics is the one I'm going to spend more time talking about. Well, this is something I'm involved in now. It's also related to energy systems. And uh, Argon has a very strong pro program funded by DOE in uh, reactor modeling. So uh, DOE has this big program called NEOPS, Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling Simulation. There is a well, fairly healthy funding in this program, program and Argon is the one who was cho chosen for, for that. So uh, they tried to develop a modern set of design and analysis tools for uh, simulating uh, liquid metal cooled fast reactors. And eventually they really want to do true remote uh, integrative simulations when they want to couple thermal hydraulics models with Neutron transport with structural mechanics. We are not there yet. Uh, we are developing this. But the, I mean, those are all different codes from completely different uh, backgrounds. It's, well, technically not easy to couple. But even within the thermal hydraulics, within the code I'm working with, you still can do integrative simulations in terms of fluid thermal interactions I talked about. So you can actually look what happens with temperature on the fluid side and with temperature on the solid side within this one code. Um, so this is probably the last project I'll talk about, and then I will just uh, slow down and let you take some questions. I have more stuff after that, but maybe less relevant to energy systems. Let me just explain you, so you have idea of uh, thermal hydraulics and uh, cooling in, uh, in fast reactors. So we have those uh, uh, fuel pits. 217 of them in this prototype they developed. And uh, those fuel pins are very high, so we want to cool them. So coolant is a liquid sodium, and it is pushed in between those pins. So pins are actually solid, and fluid goes in between them. And as you see, of course, pins can just float around in the coolant because it's not structurally stable. 
uh, they have to connect to each other somehow. So the way they connect it is by uh, wires which are helically wrapped around them and they connect the pins to each other. So it is a very difficult geometry. Very difficult geometry to model. So they did have some uh, some realistic calculations with 217 pins. They of course started with we started with a smaller one with seven pins. Uh, this was previous simulation then done by uh, Dr. Fisher. So this is some uh, flow fields. It's all very good except that they cheated here. They couldn't model the the realistic geometry exactly because you see here when the pin connects with the wire, it's supposed to be circle in a circle. Instead, they have this small line here, so it's a circle with some kind of a black on top of it. It's because with one, with a single mesh, so remember the domain was a single domain before, the code was single domain, and it didn't have multi-domain capability. Uh, so with a single mesh, you cannot model that exactly when the wire goes around it as well, it's, it's tough. So they cheated. Now with the approach we developed, with the multi-domain approach, we can we are able not to cheat. So we can uh, use two domains. In one domain, we would model the, uh, the mesh inside the pin. In another domain, the mesh inside the wire and the fluid dynamics, uh, the domain for fluids. So with the new mesh, with the overlapping mesh, you can model it. So before, they made simulations, but they were not integrative simulations with one code. Now we are trying to do Integrative simulation with two codes, but they are also integrative because now we can look at propagation of fluid inside, or propagation of temperature inside the fluid and inside the solid because now we have a correct contact line between them. So we can actually model this uh, connection between, between fluid and the solid. So now we are trying to launch that with conjugate heat transfer capability. So you have your heat conduction code for inside the pin and the wire. You have your fluid code uh, in the fluid and you can. Uh, look at it. And that's, that's the project which is going on now. So I'm just showing it in 3D. So we have a solid domain, um, and we have some temperature in the solid and temperature in the fluid, and uh, it's still ongoing. So as for results, maybe in spring. Oh, well, in winter, maybe. So, uh, okay. Now we have five minutes left, and I still have a lot of slides, so I can just sort of go through them real quick, or I can just stop here. What should I do? I think we'll, we'll stop here. Okay. Yeah. Stop here. And so then. let me just conclude them. Yeah. Okay, the rest of the talk, I was going to talk about fluid structure interaction. It's my ongoing development at Northwestern. The goals for that would be uh, look for wind energy after that, because I'm interested in, in looking into wind energy research, the turbine uh, flutter, tur and also in biological flows. So I was trying here I would talk about restructure interaction and biofluids, but since it's an energy system seminar, it might not be very relevant anyway. And to conclude, my goal is to perform integrative simulations in complex systems and uh, to look for uh, those uh, to accounting of multiple processes across the domains. And I guess I can't really say I did that and that and that, that, that was my talk was about. So I'm just going to thank you for your attention and uh, ask if you have any questions. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, when you actually do format or create your overlapping mesh, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, do you enforce any kind of collocation on the mesh? And also, how do you determine how far, or to what extent, the, the meshes overlap? Do you include like some sort of boundary layer, or how That's do you actually... That's a very good question. So I don't determine. enforce any collocation, no. And for overlap, I don't have any specific criteria. It's usually good to have larger overlaps than smaller overlap, because numerically it's more stable. You saw that, okay. uh, you didn't see, but the larger overlap is the most stable uh, coupling you get. Um, of course, geometrically, you have some concerns, because um, First of all, in terms of computer power, you don't want to make overlap too big because you accounted for it twice and you don't need to. Uh, so yes, there are two sort of phenomena which counteract each other and which we need to compromise, but we don't have any specific guidelines. It's like, not like a rule of thumb. Uh, do you enforce any kind of uh, weighting, like say if a uh, phenomenon is closer to the end of the mesh that's closer to, say, region one, that the physics is much more weighted towards that? I do not do that, but it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting point, but I do not do that.
So in our lab, we yeah. have to, we will have two solutions. Yeah. One from one code, another yeah. from another code. They're not going to exactly match. Uh, with the spectral code, uh, we can make sure that the matching goes down uh, with the spectral accuracy. So they become closer and closer together if we put more, more computational nodes in there. With coupling of compressible and low Mach number codes, it's a whole separate issue because physics is different there. And you always get this max square error. So you will not be able to get rid of it because this is, this is how much equations don't match mathematically. So it is a very good point of trying to weigh it in terms of physics. Yeah. How do you couple on those overlap repeats? What is the basic? And there are several coupling approaches in overlap. Well, basically, you just, it's, it's very simple. You just need to get interface conditions from one code to another code. And you need to, if, if you are in, in this particular code, which is surrounded by the other domain, you just need to interpolate your variables. And uh, so you can do bilinear interpolation, which, which is the easiest, but it will give you second order accuracy. You can do spectral interpolation for the spectral code. But that's basically it. You just need to get that value. And of course, there is another issue of how you use this value. Do you just strictly inject in the other code or use some kind of penalty conditions? And yeah, that's I, 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 I mostly just bl blindly use them from the very from, and it seems to be very robust injection rate. It seems to be the most robust. Do you, have you checked though? Is you know the issue with that is you have different appearances, and again, your energy transfer from one domain to the other is usually the issue. Uh, and that also sometimes gives you stability problems, right? Basically, you have two different. Right, right. So there are stability problems. Usually, if, like you. Pass a wave from one side. Some will right. reflect artificially. So yeah, we do look at wave reflection as well. So basically, the more accurate your interpolation is, the better it is. So yeah, sure. the more points you get, the better solution you get. So you just need to check that you get a conversion solution when you increase your order accuracy. I did try some other coupling methods like uh, penalty, I believe. So you don't strictly enforce that continuity, mm -hmm. but you sort of do it sort of penalty term. And that seems to work, to work worse in terms of stability. Yeah. And theoretically, it's, I mean, it's hard thing to prove. It's, it's a hard system to prove Edison, but it's an ongoing research. So this is like why it makes it so interesting to couple different codes. Um, <laughs> um, just, just curious, so you were mentioning exascale computing. Uh, uh, what would you say are some of the obstacles to achieving exascale computing at the current time? Well, there are hardware issues, so that uh, they need to have uh, computers which which can uh, operate on such a such a high uh, floating operation per second count. And there is also okay, so there's hardware issues. There is a like sort of issue of how connect them on a network basis. And there is also software issues. So you need to make sure that your code can scale to that many processors. And uh, Usually, if you have a code and you try to use 100,000 processors, then uh, it's not going to give you optimal performance. So you need to be right. really careful that everything is optimized and that uh, you don't have any arrays which which scale with the number of processors, for example. That is a nightmare, right? Because you have 100,000 processors. If you have that array, so you need to make sure your code is very clean and uh, algorithmic in it. So it's uh, issues like that, yeah. What, what is the problem with green turtles? I thought it's already developed completely, so there is no nothing to do there. There is nothing to do. No? <laughs> well, uh, the problem, the, like when there are large green turbines, uh, then this uh, durability issue becomes very important, right? So they fluctuate a lot uh, when uh, when they are encountered by the turbulent winds, and you want to make sure they don't break. And I mean. There is always a way to optimize the efficiency, right? You can always make things better. So I'm not sure they are 100% optimal. They can become more efficient and then great uh, mechanical research can help there. So when you do the coupling, how intrusive is that to the code? I mean, if you have two separate Right, I tried to make it minimally intrusive, so I compiled them uh, 
compile them together into single executable, so they are run uh, like out of a single uh, uh, out of a single file, out of a single command, and that hopefully decreases the communication time and this uh, sort of communication uh, overhead. If you have completely different codes, of course, you can't really combine them into the single executable. Uh, well, what they do, they develop some special interpolation models through Python, which sort of control the way the code talk to each other. But I'm trying to do it on a sort of, sort of core but, basis, uh, uh, compile them together. The same for work. They must have different time settings. I'm sure that must have been right, right. intrusive, it's, it's right? That was codes, they were completely different codes. Yeah. 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 So you had to... Uh, that had to be fairly intrusive, or were you able to come well, like, over the post-processing codes? You know, I did compile them into a single scheme as well, into a single code. I just had to make sure that one code waits for the other. So I do my interface condition exchange. Mm -hmm. I didn't do iterations with the Stanford code because uh, they had such different numerics that sort right. of optimize their sub iteration was tough. So I would just do information exchange in the beginning of time step, let the code do what they want for one time step, and do it again. So that was not very intrusive, just a couple of subroutines you need to call it. API calls and make sure they wait for each other. So it's like the explicit side. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I didn't do any implicit copying. It's always explicit. So always but with the, the spectral code, code, with the spectral code, I can do some iterations because numerics is the same and it's just much cleaner to couple it. Do you play boundary conditions through your elements, or does your does your even your overlapping mesh does it have to conform to the Dirac boundary conditions? In fluid conditions? structure, I don't do overlapping mesh. Uh, you don't. I'm not quite sure how to do overlapping mesh when there's fluid in the structure, oh. because uh, this if the, if if you have at least two flows in the same region, that's at least a flow. But with fluid structure, I'm trying to do conform mesh. Yes. And that is probably easier because your your, your structure always conforms to your fluid in, uh, right, I guess it's always like that. Components always overlap simply, but yeah. I will just have to make sure that my structural mesh is going to hmm. yeah, be collocated and then overlap with the structure. I can show you what, well, I, um, I didn't go very far with that. So I need some modeling and some. So basically what you do is a uh, sort of uh -huh. not, not overlap. And uh, you have a, you make sure that the computation nodes agree with each other here. The Jack is our modeling expert, so more questions from Jack is better for us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's good. Yeah. In the slide where you showed equations, the number of equations was less than the number of variables. So how, how do you uh, for, for incompressible code? I think it was uh, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, incompressible. 13. Like number 13, I think. Yes. Here. Yeah, so with compressible system, everything is simple. It is the same number of equations unknown, right? There's also. No. no. One, well, there two. is pressure as well. I don't call it unknown because uh, I should probably put that. But, but you have three equations. No, uh, <laughs> well, really six, right? Continuity, three momentum, one energy, and plus the state, the equation of state, so it's six. Oh, yes, because we have three. So it's six equations, and there are six unknowns because uh, pressure is also known. It's not, I mean, you can always rely on pressure through temperature and density. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, so we don't deal with pressure as it is. I guess you can eliminate one of those equations, but I should have a little pressure here to avoid. With incompressible system, it's a bit harder to understand because incompressible system is just, it's elliptic. And uh, so this is not a variable, this is just a constant which is enforced to you from uh, your external world. This is the zero sort of pressure, it's, it's constant. And it, uh, if your system is closed, it doesn't change. There's no chemical reactions, it just doesn't change with time. Uh, 
this one is the variable, but we have again same amount of variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have five. Well, I guess you can count it. It's supposed to work. Yes? Uh, well, so the only multi-scale type of models I'm involved with is this uh, Oceanic models. When, uh, there is, but this is not nanoscale. We are talking about scales of maybe meters versus kilometers, which is a, which is a multi-scale, but not. I'm also we also uh, thinking of modeling the uh, airway trees, uh, pulmonary airway trees. So we're going to start with big vessels and then they branch fractals and uh, go down to very small scales. We are interested in modeling that in Northwestern. Okay. It's not again going to be, well, it's going to be pretty small scales, yes. but probably still not nanoscales. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I Well, I have one non-technical question. Uh, you mentioned this program is being supported by the nuclear, uh, uh, yes. nuclear program, right? Yeah, yeah. Is it like a subset of program or the core program funding all of this? This is a program run by the uh, Office of Science, I believe, by the DOE Office of Science. Right. And uh, so I think it targets national labs and gives them a big chance of money and they perform the simulations. The labs can do whatever they want with their money, so they can subsidize universities, uh, they can subcontract universities to do research, or they can do in-house research. Um, so, and there was a, like a uh, tender to win that, and many labs participated, and I won one in this particular one. Well, there are other problems with that, otherwise, yeah, so it's always a big competition with the lab to get the funding. Yeah, Another non technical one, the P Fisher. Is it Paul Fisher or? Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Well, if not, let's thank the speaker. So, wonderful. <laughs>